Royal Highness, Excellencies, Delegates of the Federation of Hong Kong Business Associations Worldwide, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, it is a pleasure and great honor uh, today to have the opportunity of listening to the Chief Executive of Hong Kong. Mr. Tsang doesn't need any introduction, but allow me to say a few words about the man I learned to know, to respect, and to admire during my 20 years in Hong Kong. Donald Zhang is a man of the people. The son of a police sergeant, he was raised in the respect of the community, devoted to the service of Hong Kong. As a civil servant from 1967, he has spent his whole life serving Hong Kong. Through many posts, I will not list them, but I would like to pinpoint two events uh, I've witnessed myself. One was when uh, Mr. Tsang was financial secretary, 1997, October, the Asia crisis. Fortunately, Hong Kong was very lucky to have Mr. Zhang as financial secretary. He had the courage to take bold, courageous measures to put the economy on the right track. And for those who lived here, you know, when interest rates were 300% overnight and that kind of situation, this is a real crisis. But our financial secretary was up to the task. A few years later, in 2003, SARS. We all in this town were living in fear for our life. 299 people died during this uh, terrible event and many were left with uh, a destroyed health. Again, drastic measures had to be taken and fortunately we had a chief sec secretary who was a true leader and led Hong Kong through this terrible crisis. Now that Mr. Zhang has been a chief executive for the last seven years, he has taken Hong Kong to new directions. He has helped Hong Kong people to embrace new challenges, to break new ground together, he has helped Hong Kong to share prosperity for a caring society. And now he is leading Hong Kong from strength to strength. You might have noticed I refer to some of the policy addresses there. Now, it is my pleasure and my honor to ask you to stand up and give the warmest welcome to the Honorable Donald Zhang, Chief Executive of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region of the Peoples of China. Thank you. George, ladies and gentlemen, you are very kind. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am a bit overwhelmed by George's um, introductory remarks, um, which makes me feel exceedingly humble in front of all of you for what I have done over the past years as a public servant of Hong Kong, uh, a mission which I have derived uh, enormous satisfaction, also comparable measure of uh, frustration. Um, but it has been a pride, it's been a pride to serve the people of Hong Kong. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to join you for this 12th Hong Kong Forum. 
a very warm welcome to our visitors who have come from afar to be here today. As members of the Federation of Hong Kong Business Associations worldwide, we are all part of the family. So, Fun Ying. This is an especially poignant meeting for me because it will be the last time I have the honor of addressing the Hong Kong Forum as Chief Executive. My term will end on June 30th next year. So please accept my heartfelt, heartfelt thanks, personal thanks, for all that you have done and that all you will continue to do for Hong Kong. Over the past 40 odd years in public service, I have had the privilege of visiting many countries covered by the Federation's umbrella. I deeply appreciate your hard work and commitment to building and maintaining strong links with Hong Kong. Apart from being our friends and partners, you are our eyes and ears across the continents. You let us know when we are doing a good job, and perhaps more important, you also let us know when we need to do better. There is always room for improvement. In a city which is so open, we are always looking for ways to improve our trade, our investment, our innovation, our arts, our cultural links with our partners worldwide. And this is one of the reasons why Hong Kong has been able to weather the storms that have come our way and flourish in a global village. This is what I want to talk about today. I also want to share with some of my share with you some of my experiences over the years and my hopes for the future of Hong Kong. Your federation was established at the turn of the century, which I have reminded myself was the year 2000 and not year 1900. If we cast our minds back just 11 years ago, it was a time of great optimism despite all the misplaced anxiety about the millennium bug. It was a new century, and a new century warranted a new start. Some predicted it would be the Asian century, the China century, the APEC century. But whichever way you look at it, Hong Kong was at the center of the action, in the right place, at the right time. But things don't always go as planned. And the first decade of the new century was very much a mixed bag of, for Hong Kong and for the rest of the world. None of us have a magical crystal ball with which to predict the future. But it would certainly be nice and useful if we could foresee how the Eurozone crisis will pan out over the next few months. A magical crystal ball could also tell us when a U.S. economy will be back and running full steam ahead. And it would be very nice to know how mainland China's economy will develop over the next few years. We cannot rely on magic, so we have to rely on what we always do in Hong Kong, and that is prepare for the worst, plan for the best, and be ready to grasp all opportunities that come our way at a time of crisis in particular. Let me start with preparing for the worst. As a relatively small and completely open economy, Hong Kong will never be immune to the swings and roundabouts of the global economy. Three years after the start of the first wave of the financial tsunami, downside risks to the global economies remain. And if, as some economists predict, things get worse before they get better, Hong Kong will inevitably feel the pinch. We know from experience that Hong Kong is a, is, a, is a resilient and dynamic economy. Much of this is down to our highly versatile and very edu well-educated workforce. People who were born and bred in Hong Kong and people from overseas and the mainland of China who have come here to live, work and make Hong Kong their home. In my final policy address last month, I devoted many column inches to the challenges ahead of us. On the home front, these include 
providing affordable housing, coping with an aging population, and ensuring smooth constitutional development. All of these areas are vital aspects of maintaining our economic dynamism, social stability, and progress as a community. I'm not going to talk about all these in great detail, but I'm confident we are making headway. Home prices have been easing gradually after recent historical highs. Government initiatives to cool the property market have, including, have included tightening mortgage borrowing ratios and increasing land supply. We are providing ample resources to caring for the elderly and making sure the less well-off will also benefit from our city's prosperity. On constitutional reform, the chief executive and the legislative council elections next year will be more democratic than before and will lay the foundations for us to achieve universal suffrage for the chief executive elections in 2017 and electoral elections in 2020. Many of you represent small and medium-sized enterprises, or SMEs. The 300,000 or so SMEs in Hong Kong are the backbone of our economy. They account for 98% of our business and employ almost half of the private sector workforce. Well, given the uncertain global economic outlook, we have been paying particular attention to the difficulties SMEs may face going forward, such as obtaining credits, insurance loans, or startup loans. So in year 2008, we were quick to in introduce a special loan guarantee schemes for our SME at the height of the financial tsunami. This and other initiatives help keep business ticking over during the worst of the tsunami. We have a variety of other SME funding initiatives that cover areas such as research and development, innovation and technology, design and expert promotion. As a result, the Asian financial crisis more than a decade ago, we have worked hard to shore up our financial services sector. Our banks are very well capitalized and, meet, and exceed the latest Basel Accords for liquidity risk management and capital adequacy ratios. We have also have a half a million deposit guarantee uh, to de maintain public confidence in the banking system. Most of all, my administration runs a robust and clean fiscal system, tight on taxes, meticulous on government spending, and with balanced budget, a healthy reserve, and zero debt. We keep our powder dry and are prepared for the worst. Well, these are some of the ways we're preparing for the worst. If a double-dip recession materializes, unfortunately, or if we run into future economic and financial crisis down the line, we remain alert and we stand ready to devise effective countermeasures to keep our economy afloat and relief measures for our business, businesses and people at the grassroots to overcome short-term difficulties. This brings me to planning for the best. This is all about taking full advantage of our unique strengths and deploying our resources wisely. Compared with other economies, Hong Kong is a relative, in a relatively strong position. Our city's strengths and advantages help us stand out from the competition. We are prosperous enough to build on these strengths, and we have the talent and experience to pull it off. In many ways, Hong Kong's raison d'etre in the business world is to help unlock the full economic potential just across the boundary in the mainland of China. So it's a little surprise that we invest heavily in cross-boundary infrastructure. Construction is underway on a massive Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau bridge. Despite its name, this project is more than a bridge. It is a 50-kilometer corridor of bridges and tunnels that will open up the less developed western part of the Pearl River Delta, or PRD as we call it. When completed in the year 2016, it will link major cities in the PRD, bringing goods, services, people, and with them the ideas to the new markets more efficiently 
and more cost effectively. Think of it as a pearl corridor connecting places with the hottest prospects for growth in our region. Another exciting cross-boundary project under construction is the express rail link. The key aspect of this express line is that it will plug Hong Kong into the vast high-speed rail network in the mainland. The system will be up and running sometimes in the year 2015. In making such large investments in our city's infrastructure and future, it is vital to have the right soft infrastructure in place too. One major vehicle for our cross-boundary soft infrastructure is a framework agreement on the Hong Kong Guangdong Cooperation, which we signed in Beijing last year. It supports stronger cross-boundary cooperation in a range of areas including trade, finance, innovation, environment, as well as quality living and town planning. The overarching goal is to establish the PRD region as one of the most competitive regions in the world by the year 2020. And this, this brings me to the final point, grasping new opportunities. This has become a common theme for economies around the world as they seek ways out of the current economic turmoil. I have always thought of Hong Kong as a small place with a big heart. We don't shrink from challenges, regardless of the size, their size and nature. If we take a hit, we get right back up and start again. This is all part of the advantage of being a small and nimble economy with our own style and cultural flair. It is also the reason why almost 7,000 mainland or overseas companies have a base in Hong Kong today. Together with our local firms, these international and mainland companies are always on the lookout for the next opportunity. It is our job in government not to pick winners, but, but to provide the best environment for our businesses to succeed. That means listening to you, our business experts, and that's important, and these are some of the things the business community likes about Hong Kong and which we also treasure. First, our low and simple tax system. It means businesses and people that they employ get to keep most of what they earn. Businesses have more profits to reinvest in their companies, in R&D and innovation technology. It also means they don't have to spend excessive amounts of time and money on compliance and complicated tax returns. Second, our tried and trusted common law legal system, underpinned by an independent judiciary. Then our no-nonsense approach to tackling corruption because it provides a level playing field for everyone in business. Our efficiency and a way that we try to cut through the red tape as much as possible, which again saves time and money. Companies also like the fact that we have a stable government that values its people and their freedom. They like our free flows of capital and information and world-class services and information communications technology. They like that Hong Kong is well connected and fully engaged with the rest of the world. All of this gives our business community confidence and stability. It helps them remain flexible and responsive. It allows them to save time and money and to invest in the future and it gives them space to see and seize new opportunities. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is just a, a broad overview of all, how Hong Kong has developed and the foundations on which we will build our future success. I do hope that you enjoy your stay in Hong Kong, sample our great food, indulge yourself in a huge variety of wines now on offer in our city, and celebrate the cultural diversity that make us the Asia's world city. You also see that our city is once again festooned with beautiful lights of the festive, festive season, which means that Christmas and then Chinese New Year are around the corner. So please remember, there's no other better place to do your Christmas shopping than Hong Kong. <laughs> Nothing will make me happier than to hear that your credit cards are getting the very good workout <laughs> with the retail therapy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chief Executive. Please be seated on the stage.
Now, may I invite Mr. Legrault to moderate a question and answer session for us. Mr. Legrault, please. Well, thank you, uh, Chief Executive. We have uh, just a few minutes for questions, and uh, thank you, Chief Executive, to, uh, to be ready for that. If you allow me, uh, I will ask you a question about something maybe a bit different from what you, you said. The success of Hong Kong, of course it's its people, but it's also the structure which has been agreed uh, with the Chinese government, the one country, two systems, uh, a high degree of autonomy, uh, people, uh, Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong. Uh, could you, I think some people might be wondering uh, if it works really. I'm convinced it does, but could you uh, elaborate on that and your experience uh, in, in this field? Thank you. I truly believe it has worked wonderfully for Hong Kong. And I may I confess to you, I have been pleasantly surprised how it has succeeded, how it has overcome my own concern in the very beginning, running, running up to 1997 in the handover. And I think my concern was partly shared by many people in Hong Kong worldwide. But the things have worked out very well. Our way of life, our own value system, our legal system, our currency, our strengths, and our people are all intact. Perhaps I'm in a, in a more privileged position to make a comparison of the way of life, particularly Hong Kong as a community, as a competitive community, before and after 1997. I served the government of Hong Kong under the British administration for over 30 years before 1997. And in after 1997, I have been in service for Hong Kong again in a new government for the past 14 years. If you look a little objectively over the political, social, and economic horizons of Hong Kong over the past 14 years, you will discover not only that none of our main value system or the things we treasure most, like the rule of law, the level playing field, the freedoms that we enjoy, a clean government, not only they have remained, they have strengthened under the new system. Our sovereign state have delivered their part of the bargain and let Hong Kong run its own affairs. If you look at it politically, we have advanced enormously in terms of election, in terms of representation of the people. We have now got a timetable for introducing universal suffrage, a sort of thing we have never heard of before 1997. And we're going to have that for the chief executive in the year 2017 and a universal suffrage election for the whole legislature as early as 2020. Socially, not only in terms of income of people, the economic performance of Hong Kong as a place, livelihood of the people, particularly the grassroots. We have introduced a much better social welfare scheme since then, a more comprehensive and better public health system that the people of Hong Kong enjoy perhaps the, long, the, 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 the longest living for any people in species, or human species on earth. Our men live to now over 80 and our women to 85. Perhaps uh, they have a life expectancy higher than anywhere else on earth. And what's more, we have introduced minimum, statutory minimum wage for our people. We have also have introduced schemes to help people in times of stress, like the transport subsidy for people in the working class. All these were introduced after 1997. Economically, Hong Kong is now, by universal recognition, a global financial center, the most important offshore trend center for, for trading of renminbi. We have earned our triple eight rating recently, despite the financial tsunami, despite the Asian financial crisis Hong Kong had gone through. Last year, we grew by 7% in GDP. This year, we're likely to do five. Next year, who knows, depends on Europe and America, but we won't do badly. So measure on anything in Hong Kong against what we had before 97, Hong Kong has made enormous advancement, 
And this is a true reflection of the success of the one country, two systems that we operate. That rests my case. Maybe I'll invite the floor for one question. Uh, could, if you want to ask a question, raise your hand, in, indicate your name, organization, and keep the question short, please. No. no. Yes, please. Yes, I'm. Yeah, I'm Carmo Say from the Hong Kong Canada Business Association. Uh, obviously, Mr. Jung has done a lot for Hong Kong for, the, for more than 40 years. Uh, what are your own personal plans after June 30th? <laughs> you, you have to think for yourself. Well, um, I have a few plans. Uh, I might share with some of them. First of all is um, I want to get away completely from public life if I can help. And um, the, I want to Recently, I've developed a, a hobby for photography. So I really wish to, to photograph birds in Kamchatka in Russia. I want to see the photographs, the migration of wildebeest in, in Kenya. So these are the first and two ambitions that I want to fulfill uh, while I still remain mobile and still walk and run and carry my cameras and heavy lenses around. Then I want to go back to school and do some studying. Um, so that I can read the Bible properly. But there are a few private plans, but all these very private issues. But thank you for asking, but I, I can assure you I won't be standing on your way or the, staying on the way <laughs> or my successor. Um, but my heart is in Hong Kong. This is a place where I was born, the place where I was bred and away, a place to which I owe my entire life and filled with people whom I admire and I'm sure you're going to do all from strength to strength. Thank you, Chief Executive. Mr. Zhang is the proof that Hong Kong is not just about making money. It is service to the community. And I would like to thank you, Chief Executive, for this most authoritative uh, presentation of Hong Kong and that message from the heart. Donald Zhang, a man of the people, a man for all seasons. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chief Executive and Mr. Legrand.